The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. You might be wondering why am I leaning on this old Tektronix oscilloscope? Well, because it's almost exactly the same height as my elbow. But also because today is oscilloscope day. Now you've seen us use scopes in the show before. We have this handheld Agilent that sits on my desk, but you might be wondering, what do scopes really do? Well, we're gonna find out. We're going to go down to MATC, the Madison Area Technical College, and use the scopes in one of their labs to solve some problems. Let's get started. Amazing builds, exclusive mods, cutting edge ideas, electronics, engineering, and more. Every week on Element 14's The Ben Heck Show. Okay, here are the three questions that we're going to try to find answers to at MATC in their oscilloscope lab. The first one is we're gonna to try to determine the dot clock frequency of a display that I created. The display is driven with machine language and I guess I could go in there and count the cycles but by instructions or I could just hook it up to an oscilloscope and that'll tell me what the frequency is. The second thing we're going to look at is the timing of an I squared C EEPROM write. I squared C bus and writing EEPROMs are both kind of slow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the oscilloscope to figure out exactly how long this packet takes to transmit. Because it's not quite instantaneous, it could be a few milliseconds, which is a long time in the grand scheme of things. The third thing we're going to look at is using the logic analyzer on an oscilloscope, we're going to hook up the entire address bus of an Atari 2600 game console and try to capture the reset vector. Now by using that, we'll see every line of the address bus. So instead of seeing like a particular pattern or waveform, we're actually gonna capture the data coming off the CPU as it goes through the oscilloscope. And we're looking for the reset vector, which is the first address that the CPU tries to go to when you boot up a system. Let's go to MATC and get started. Road trip! For our first demonstration, we're going to find out what the dot clock is on this display for a vendor who's interested in helping us with a new design. So to test it, we're going to hook up the scope to the actual output line. Now, I did write the machine language that drives this. However, I don't know exactly how fast it goes. All I know is that it goes fast enough <laughs> to work. Um, but if it's hooked up to an FPGA, we are going to probably need to know the exact timing. So what happens with this display is it draws it one line at a time and shifts it into uh, 16, oh, I'm sorry, it shifts it into eight 16-bit shift registers. And then it does that 16 times in a row to create 16 levels of PWM brightness. So for every one of these pixels, there's going to be a clock edge as it clocks out the data. And the pixels are actually, there's four bits per pixel, so it's one byte for every two pixels. So we'll probably see the separation in there as well where the math occurs, if you will. So I'm gonna unplug this. And I have the data sheet here, which tells me which pin is the dot clock. So that's gonna be nine. And then we'll dial in the scope to find it. Uh, so here's your scope probe. They attach here, they're, they're already attached in this case. And you always wanna ground it, otherwise it won't work. So we're gonna attach this to our ground reference. And sometimes, you know, if you have two channels, um, you might think the grounds are connected, but there's actually some scopes where you have to connect both the grounds. So if you want two channels, you have to connect both grounds as well. But at the moment, we only need one channel. Now what we need to learn with this example is the actual frequency of the dot clock. On the screen here, you can see a grid, and this is going to be your time uh, divisions. So horizontally, each grid represents a certain amount of time. In this case, we're at 32 nanoseconds. So here we're in uh, milliseconds, MS, microseconds, what looks like a US, and nanoseconds, NS. So thousands, millions, billions of a second. This may look like a screen full of nonsense, but our signal's actually in there someplace. Okay, so. So the vertical control basically scales how much you see of it in the screen there. And now, uh, see this mark here, five volts per division. Each one of these squares vertically is five volts. All right, two volts. That's closer to what we're using because this is 3.3 volt logic level. Now we're gonna zoom in. Actually, I'm gonna just center this just so it's easier to see. There we go. 
I'm gonna zoom in horizontally. Now it actually starts to look like something. See this? Okay, now there are our dot pulses. If you look here, you can see the edges where there's a bit of a pause. That's going to be when it's actually switching lines. So if we look in, this is probably gonna be 128 pulses, 128 pixels horizontally. And then it's, that dot clock will stop briefly as it pulses to the next line. So you can actually see that with your scope. So basically the scope is a way of seeing what your signals are doing visually so that a human can understand them. Okay, I'm actually gonna hit run stop and it will store its last state. Now we can look at what we captured. The amount of data you can store depends on your scope. Usually the nicer ones will have more data and the cheaper ones will be less. All right, so right here we can clearly see here is a row advance, a row advance. And if we were to count these, I bet we'd have 128 pulses. I'm not gonna bother counting because I'm pretty sure that's what it's gonna be. Now, if we zoom in a little closer, you can see another division going on. See how there's a little bit of a gap here? So you have one, two, gap, one, two, gap. So the machine language program reads a byte from main memory and then it's like, okay, how do I put this byte on the display? And here it's comparing both of the PWM values and putting the pixel onto the display. And the other gap you see here is it reading the next byte from main memory. Reads and writes from main memory are, are a lot slower than anything else that the processor might do, and that's why you see a gap here. So the information that we really need to find while we're here is the frequency of the dot clock. And it's not consistent, well, it's consistent, but it has, it has gaps in it. But the maximum frequency that we'd be looking at, okay, I'm gonna line these guys up here. Okay, so it's just over 200 nanoseconds. 50, 50, 50, 50. Uh, okay, so probably about, probably about 225 was a good. Okay. You can engage auto scale on your scope and it'll tell you the frequency pretty easily as well. Uh, okay, and that's 400 nanoseconds. All right. Yeah, you can clearly see the line separation there. Now it's time for a tech timeout. Whoa, we're back in the shop. Weird. We've been using some pretty nice oscilloscopes at MATC, but I wanted to show you that there are some cheaper scopes that you can get. This is a $50 X-Proto Lab oscilloscope from Gabatronics. It's basically just an OLED screen, op amp, and AVR microcontroller, but it does function as a, I believe, 20 kilohertz oscilloscope and it even has an eight channel logic analyzer on it. You can also get ones like this that are a little bit more fancy, a little larger for around 70 or $80. So there's really a scope out there for every budget. And then when you're ready to move up to an Agilent or Tektronics, you can do that as well. This display obviously works, but if we were building something and it wasn't working, then oscilloscope is a great way to figure out what the problem is because we can analyze things that we can't see with the human eye. You can see if this is working, but if it's not working, who knows what's going on? All right, so I've hooked up both channels here. Now, here we go. So most oscilloscopes will have at least two channels. And that's pretty common. And the reason that's useful is because we can compare the channels. Let me zoom in here. Okay, so the green, this is channel two. That's gonna be our dot clock. Whereas this channel here that we were using before, it's gonna be our data clock. In this case, we can see what the channels are doing in relation to each other. Here is our actual pixel data. Here's our pixel clock. We can see that the data line is brought high while the pixel clock line is high. So what it's doing right here is it's clocking out one, two, three pixels of on data, basically ones, the pixels are on. And then there's another clock pulse here and this has gone low, so that's off. So we can physically see here, well, phys visually see here, <laughs> that we have one, two, three pixels of data and then a blank pixel of data. And when we, obviously when we zoom out, it doesn't make as much sense, but that's the good thing about scopes is you can use them to actually see what's going on in your circuit. Again, so it's one, two, three, four, five 
five pixels of continuous on, and then it goes off. So there's three pixels of basically blank, comes back on again. So yeah, by using the two channels together, we can see the relationship between signals on our project and figure out what they're doing. So if your project wasn't working, by analyzing how these things go together, you can certainly figure out what's going on. But all the examples we brought today work, so it's kind of hard to show troubleshooting, but this will at least get you started. Uh, let's try auto scale. <laughs> Most modern scopes will have the cheater button, the auto scale button. Uh, it's very handy, I use it all the time, because like, pfft, no thought required. Uh, it's kind of like learning how to drive a car with a automatic transmission. It's great and all, but if you ever had to, you know, drive a stick shift, you might not know what to do. For the next example, we're going to do an I squared C EEPROM analysis. I squared C is a very useful serial bus. You can connect up to 128 devices on one line, but it can be a little slow. EEPROMs can also be slow, and when you write them, it takes longer to do that than to read them. So you wanna make sure they've actually completed their write before you do anything else. So I've got my probes here hooked up to the serial data and serial clock lines of an I squared C EEPROM. And when I touch this pin, my system will write uh, four bytes to it or one long. Using the scope, we can catch that event and see how long it takes. All right, so we're gonna turn on both channels. Okay, and right now they're right on top of each other, so I'm gonna move them down here. There we go. All right, so we're at five volts per division. I'm gonna bump that up to two volts per division. Working with two, uh, we're working with 3.3 volt logic here. All right. So here's our base lines. Now they're high right now because there are pull-up resistors on the I squared C lines. Pretty much any I squared C device should have pull-up resistors on it. Now if I toggle this, see the data go by in the blink of an eye? We wanna capture that. So for that, we're gonna use a trigger. Trigger basically is something on a scope where it sees a certain event and then triggers an action. It'll store the data or analyze it in some other way. Okay, so the trigger, we want the edge. So we want, well in this case, it's actually the falling edge that we want. So we want the falling edge. So source one, that's fine. Trigger edge, okay, so here's, here, okay. Slope, we wanna make this falling, okay. Yeah, looks like you can toggle through these or turn the knob. All right, that's cool. All right, now, see this little T? That's our trigger level. I'm gonna have it about halfway. Okay, so there's some noise on the line, but as long as we're down here, it'll only trigger on an actual data acquisition. Okay, bounce out of here, and there's another mode. All right. Now I hit single, and it should sit here and wait until it actually sees the falling edge, hence the data it's looking for. There, we caught it. Now it goes right to stop mode and we can actually scroll through and look at what we got. So you've got two lines here. I squared C has a stop and start condition. So they're both pulled low and the higher one here, channel one, that's going to be your clock. And the green is gonna be your data. Before we were looking at clocks that were continuously going for the screen, it was constantly clocking out data. With an I squared C right, you don't know when it's gonna happen. So by using the trigger function of your oscilloscope, you can catch it in the blink of an eye faster than you could possibly do with your fingers and then have a chance of looking at it. Here is a full burst of I squared C EEPROM right? That sounds like, like a juicy treat for kids, like a full burst of flavor. We have our data here and our clock here. Now, if we look at it, this is basically the start condition saying, hey, device, whatever, I wanna to talk to you. Here's it telling it what to do, and here's the actual data. And if you look, you can see the grouping, one, two, three, four bytes. And this one's a bit longer because that's your stop condition. Now the real thing to take away from this is the time. So we can line this up here on the grid, okay. One millisecond per division. So this operation is taking two milliseconds. That's an eternity on a microcontroller. But the moral of the story is the I squared CE problem is pretty slow and it took a scope to tell us that. 
This is one of those situations where you might be writing some code and be like, oh, why is it not working? You know, why am I not getting back the same data that I write? And with the scope, we learned that, hey, if you're writing the data too fast, the I squared C bus and the EEPROM hasn't finished writing to itself. Therefore, if you try to read from it immediately, it either won't be in the right state or you won't get the right data back. So that's another thing scopes are good for, basically seeing what kind of actual timing is going on in your system. Our third and final example is going to be using an oscilloscope for logic analysis. So instead of like looking at a couple channels, we're going to be looking at an entire bus. The example we'll use is this Atari 2600 game console. So one project I've been wanting to build for years now is to make a super cartridge, cartridge with its own microcontroller and arm or something. You plug it into the Atari and it basically feeds better graphics into the Atari or streams and more data. So to do that, I need to analyze what the Atari is doing on boot. Now the Atari has a 6507 uh, CPU in it, which is similar to the classic 6502. 6507 is basically the same thing, but without external interrupts or as much address space. This thing can only address 8K of memory. So when this thing boots up, it's going to be looking for something called the reset vector. That is the position in memory where a CPU begins to execute code. And so for this system, it's gonna be at the top of memory. Uh, yeah, so basically all the address lines will be almost in the top. However, the reset vector is a two byte number. So it's uh, basically, it's, it's a 16 bit value because you can go from zero to six, five, five, three, five. So it won't be the absolute top of memory. It'll be like FFFE or if it's masked, one FFE or C or D. So there's gonna be two pairs near the top of memory. In some systems, uh, one of them is reserved for the reset button. So if you hit reset, the system looks at the top of memory and it'll go to these two positions. Or if you cold start it, it'll actually start here, which is why some systems will do different things depending on if they're reset or actually cold started. Cold start is on off. Okay, the scope here is set to digital mode and we have our logic analyzer probes plugged into the front and they're plugged into the cartridge. So we're looking at, well, it says data lines, but these are the address lines zero through 12, which will give us a total of 8K of addressable space. Although it's basically going to be reading its cartridge, so the D12 line is actually used as cartridge enable, so it can only see 4K in the cartridge itself. So we want to see what it's doing when it boots. So I'm going to start this guy, turn on the Atari, and that's what the Atari did. As with the other functions, we can zoom in and take a closer look at this. All right, so here's D0 through 7, that's when it starts up, and then here, where to search the full bus, that's actually when it's trying to read the cartridge. Now we can zoom in on these and basically convert them into binary to figure out what they are. So this is actually the processor working. And you don't necessarily need a full-fledged scope to do this. There are many smaller logic analyzers you can buy, such as from Sally, the little USB devices that you can plug in, and you can do this on your computer. You can also get oscilloscopes to plug into your computer. But we have these scopes here, so we're gonna use them. And one nice feature on these fancier scopes is the ability to basically look at the bus and get a value out of it. So I'm gonna go into the bus, I'm going to Say bus one, okay. Now I'm gonna go to hex. All right, so it's gonna give us the value in hex. This is where it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay. Oh, look at that. One FFE. So it's basically analyzing the binary and telling us what it is in hex. And there's our reset vector. Even an old system like the Atari is running at a much higher speed than we could ever comprehend. But with tools like the oscilloscope, we can take a look at those signals in microscopic detail and figure out what's going on. Thanks, oscilloscopes. You're welcome. Hopefully this episode gave you a good idea of what you could do with oscilloscopes and how they might pertain to your own projects. Now, oscilloscopes like this aren't the only old thing we have laying around the shop. We've also got this quite old drill press. In the next episode, we're going to see if we can fix this thing up and make it a smooth running machine that's great for shop use. We'll see you then. World's most expensive, what's that thing, brass knuckle? Okay. <clears throat> you might be wondering, why is Ben leaning on that old Tektronics oscilloscope? Well, because it's comfortable. I bought this oscilloscope for $5 at a flea market. I think I can make $10 for it. That was totally worth driving a thousand miles. In our next episode, we're gonna fix it up and get it running like new so we can use it on our shop. Don't put that in the outtakes. Hey, 
planes, it's blimps. You win. I think that's a winner. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. Join now and browse the store at element14.com.